Um, without further ado, I will now introduce you to our wonderful panel. We have with us today Alyssa Dolgova. She is the Insurance Sector Head for Financial Services Regulatory Insight Centre. We have Matt McLeod, the Prudential Re Regulation Senior Manager financial, for Financial Risk and Resilience. And we also have Radhika Baines, who is a manager for the Financial Services Regulatory Insight Centre. So I will hand over to you, Alyssa, if I may. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nafis, and um, very happy to be here to be doing a market briefing to IUA members on the BRA consultation on solvent exit planning, which is uh, one of the most exciting things which have ha has happened on the BRA regulatory uh, agenda recently, from my perspective. Indeed. So, in terms of uh, just to quickly introduce myself, as Nafisa has um, kindly introduced me, I'm Elisa Dolgova. I'm the Insurance Prudential Regulation Sector Head within the regulatory. Insight Centre at KPMG, and I'm joined by two colleagues, so Matt McLeod, who's got a lot of experience doing recovery and resolution planning for insurers, as well as, um, as, well as uh, Radhika, who um, sits with me in the Regulatory Insight Centre at KPMG. So um, as Nafisa has mentioned, you know, we'd like to make this se section as interactive and as useful to you as possible. So please do um, put your questions in the chat um, as you go along so we can answer these either as we go along or we pick up at the end. So I'm um, you know, keen to uh, make this as relevant um, to you as possible. And if there is anything that we don't cover, you know, we'll have our contact details at the end. So please do feel free to reach out. So in terms of if we go to the slide back in terms of what's on the agenda today, so uh, looking to cover a quick overview in terms of setting the context of uh, what does the uh, regulatory requirement look like, where does this fit in in terms of everything else, um, and look in terms of what's in the consultation as well, as well. but I really want to spend the bulk of our time talking through practical examples in terms of how do you actually go together um, how do, how do you go about putting together a solvent exit assessment, solvent exit execution plan, as well as how would you approach it from a project management kind of very practical getting this up and running perspective. So if we could please go to uh, the first, to the slide on uh, the regulatory context. So that's the one after this. So if, uh, and after this one, Thanks. So if I can just uh, start with just a very quick um, scene setter in terms of where this fits on the regulatory journey. So it's very much one of those reforms which has um, come in um, after following the global financial crisis. You know, there have been bank failures. The focus was very much initially on banks, systemic risk, you know, very, very lengthy bank recovery and resolution plans, overnight kind of scenario. From there, it has spread to smaller firms and also across the financial services industry. So in terms of kind of the, uh, the, the, the insurance piece, so originally it was for global systemically important insurers. Then there was a piece for internationally active insurance groups as part of IAIS work and COM, the common framework for uh, supervision of internationally active insurance groups. And, um, and then, you know, finally, um, uh, through the kind of international framework, it has come across um, into, uh, into the regimes of, ind in, of individual regulators. So kind of the original uh, policy piece for insurers was the FSB 2013 key attributes for effective resolution of insurers, which introduced the concept of critical functions in an insurance co concept, what is it that would be particularly disruptive to policyholders, to financial stability and the real economy if an insurer was to fail. But then from there, it really kind of um, expanded to a much more kind of covering every, kind of a much broader scope of um, entities context. And, um, you know, and seeing what, what's been happening on the banking side is actually quite useful. So again, you know, it's started from looking at the largest, um, at, at the largest banks, but it's now follow, gone, you know, the whole way through to um, small banks, building society. So of course the, the board, so it's kind of useful to draw those parallels. 
on the insurance regulation side, kind of uh, the PRA's consultation on solvent exit isn't the only piece. There is also a piece of legislation which is uh, will be introduced into the UK Parliament at some point. It's quite separate, although related to solvent exit planning for insurers, and then the insurance resolution regime, which will be for a handful of small or particularly critical insurers. So if an insurer provides a, a function which is uh, which the broader economy relies on um, and that can't fail, they'll be caught within the insurance res resolution regime, will be subject to additional oversight by, by the resolution authority and have additional recovery and resolution planning. But this isn't what uh, this um, topic, um, the session is about today, but it's helpful to have the, the context. So if we could please move to the next slide, at which point I'll uh, hand over to my colleague Radhika, who'll talk you through the consultation. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that, Elisa. Yes, so um, I can run through um, the details of the PRA's consultation. Um, so basically, uh, the PRA understands that recovery will often be preferable to solvent exit, but really they're asking insurers to consider solvent exit, prepare for that. And really the core principle here is that when an insurer exits the market, it is solvent and that it has discharged all of its financial obligations from its own resources. That really is one of the key principles driving this work. Um, so who is in the scope of this CP? Um, I should note that it's quite a broad scope that we've got from the PRA. So it includes all Solvency II firms, um, but they've also included non-directive firms as well as Lloyd's and their managing agents. Um, so the rationale for including non-directive firms is that these firms can be more at risk of a disorderly exit. And, and that's really why they're included. So we've got the Solvency II ladder of intervention, and it can apply to some extent to non-directive firms, but not really in the same way that it does for Solvency II firms, hence why the PRA has included non-directive firms within the scope. And on Lloyd's and uh, its managing agents, I mean, really, this market makes up such a significant share of non-life business that, that there was really no way that the PRA could exclude these firms. Um, but on exclusions, um, something to bear in mind is that third country branches are excluded from these proposals. Uh, and that's really because if a third country branch looks like it's going to fail, that will be because the legal entity in the home state looks like it's going to fail. And then in those circumstances, it's up to the home state regulator to consider solvent exit and resolution. So it's not proportionate for the PRA to apply expectations to a third country branch. So if that is you, if you are a representative of a third country branch, um, these proposals will not apply to you. Um, Another group of firms uh, that is direct, that is excluded by this proposal is firms that are in passive runoff. And, and that's really just because of the nature of their business model. Um, so planning for a solvent exit, what is it that the PRA wants insurers to do? <clears throat> so really the proposals, they include expectations for all in scope firms, uh, really to prepare for a solvent exit as part of BAU. And that is regardless of how unlikely or of how distant the prospect of solvent exit may seem. Uh, the proposals require insurers to produce and then maintain a solvent exit analysis. Now, this document should, uh, it should have records of an insurer's solvent exit preparations, and it needs to be updated uh, either one, whenever there is a material change that takes place, um, and also every three years. So those are two two uh, minimum times that these um, that this analysis needs to be updated. 
it also needs to be provided to the PRA upon request. So just bear that in mind that they can they can just ask to see this document. Um, I've got a list there of, of things that the solvent exit analysis should include information on. So, you know, you've got your solvent exit actions, your indicators, potential barriers and risks. These are all things that we will cover a bit later on in the presentation. Um, but just something to bear in mind when you're preparing your analysis is that um, this needs to be done on a solo legal entity basis. Um, if, however, as a solo entity, you are part of a wider Solvency II group, then the analysis should consider any risks that arise from you being part of that group. Um, but uh, it should still be pr produced on a solo entity basis. If you do want to prepare your analysis on a group-wide basis, uh, you will need prior PRA agreement to do this. Um, okay, so we've covered the BAU element of solvent exit analysis. Once solvent exit becomes a reasonable prospect, that's where the PRA's expectations then ramp up. And you would then be required uh, to produce a detailed solvent exit execution plan, so your SEEP. Um, this is required within one month of uh, solvent exit being a reasonable prospect. And um, it can also it can also be required if the PR if your PRA supervisor tells you that you need to prepare one. So it's your judgment, but it's also what the PRA considers um, your solvent exit prospects to be. So that's also something to bear in mind. Um, again, we've got the list here of what your solvent exit execution plan could include. Uh, the main thing here is that it needs to go into a lot more detail. So you've got your initial analysis, your execution plan then has all of the detail on how exactly you would implement your solvent exit. So it's really the level of detail and all those additional considerations that the PRA is then expecting at this stage. Um, and, and if you are at that point where you're then executing your solvent exit, um, there is an expectation for you to keep not just the PRA, but other relevant stakeholders informed throughout the process. Um, I've, I've got some details here on the consultation timeline. So the deadline for the consultation is middle of next month, 26th of April. Um, we're expecting the policy statement later this year. And the proposed implementation date is Q4 25. Um, at this point, I should add that the PRA very recently did a similar consultation for banks and building societies. Um, and they just recently released the policy statement for them. And they stuck with the uh, implementation date that they had proposed in the consultation, which was also Q4 2025. So, I wouldn't expect any movement on the implementation date. Um, so the PRA stuck quite firm to that with banks. I would expect uh, it's highly likely they would have that same approach for insurers as well. Um, could we just go to the next slide, please? Um, I won't spend too long on, on this slide. It's really just, this slide is really just a demonstration of how there are already uh, requirements for recovery and resolution. And what the PRA has done is they've taken it further to then expand the work to one, solvent exit instead of recovery and resolution, and two, really broaden the scope of firms that are included within their proposals. So you've got, um, so currently you've got your IAIGs, you've got your count one firms, many of these will already have um, existing regulatory expectations on recovery and resolution. So Elisa had talked about the IAIS common framework, she talked about the expectations from the Financial Stability Board. These are, these are applied to the larger firms that the PRA will have within their remit. If you then take it down another level and then look at the regional um, regulatory proposals, we've got the HMT consultation, um, which targets uh, a narrow group of insurance firms. And uh, that was that consultation came out um, last year. 
Then in the EU, we've also got the proposed EU Insurance Recovery and Resolution Directive. And that will look at um, many similar issues. It will look at things like um, harmonized resolution authorities within member states. It will, it will look at addressing cross-border issues and whether policyholders are given adequate protection with third country resolution proceedings. Um, so there is a lot of overlap um, and there is a lot of existing either regulation or regulatory proposals on the recovery and resolution front. What this PRA consultation does is it just goes a step further by looking at solvent exit, but then also, like I said, really expanding the scope of firms so that it's not just your cat ones, maybe a cat two, cat twos, but it's a lot of the smaller and medium sized firms that will now be captured by the consultation. Um, okay, that's a, a brief summary of uh, the proposals from me, and I believe that we have uh, an interactive question for, for the audience. So at this point, I should hand over to uh, uh, Tony. So just to say, I think you can all just click on the screen. Hopefully it should be working um, and you can just select which options are applicable to you guys. I think our results are in for you, Radhika. Okay, so okay, so we've got 50% here saying that there is a current resolution or solvent exit plan. So that's very helpful for us to gauge what where the audience is um, on, on their planning. Um, at this point, I will hand over to uh, my colleague, Elisa, and um, she can take you through uh, some of the elements of how, how we then how we then consider this further. Brilliant. Thanks, Radhika. And if we can go to the next slide. So in terms of where does this fit in, in terms of what you're already, or what uh, about half of you are already um, doing? So in terms of the solvent exit analysis, the, this fits in very, kind of very firmly within the business, uh, business as usual context. And there are already a number of uh, rules, related rules, which insurance are subject to. Um, to, so first of all, fundamental rule eight, so um, the requirement for insurers to plan for an orderly exit. Uh, secondly, the ladder of intervention as part of solvency two, and then also the supervisory statement 418 around financial uh, planning, um, financial um, planning, including scenario analysis. So um, and, and thinking through this insurers, you know, and the BRA actually encourages insurers to reuse what you already have as much as possible. Having said that, this will be the first time for many firms who are not category one in, in preparing the rules from this particular particular angle. So I've said the solvent exit analysis sits firmly within the business as usual. Um, however, the SEEP, the execution plan, somewhat muddles the waters between recovery, resolution and other elements so in terms of where it sits in the continuum so it should be prepared when solvent exit is um is um a foreseeable kind of a reasonable prospect a reasonable prospect isn't specifically defined but there is a pra buried within the supervisory um, statement which describes it as you know if you have breached your mcr you are unlikely uh, to recover so that kind of places a sort of more, 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 more so somewhere between recovery and resolution um context but but also just just to flag that it's it's uh the, the solvent exit planning should cover a variety of scenarios so both in terms of a stressed and non-stressed conditions um and so if we can move over 
to the next slide. So again, like I've, I've placed Solomon's exit on in terms of where it fits in a journey from you know, uh, normal business as usual operations through to resolution between recovery and resolution. But as I've said, you know, your planning should also consider a scenario where you are considering withdrawing your 4A affecting insurance contracts permissions for reasons other than stress conditions. So i.e., for example, it's a market you wish to, um, a legal entity wishes to exit, you know, a decision, you know, in the normal course of kind of strategic planning as well, and in which case it's kind of, it's kind of more towards the business as, as, as usual end. Um, and the BRA, you know, notes that de depending on the size of the insurer, um, you need to consider a variety of financial and non-financial indica indicators, both financial, such as, um, you know, loss of capital, PNL, reserves deterioration, but also other scenarios that can leave you to, uh, to exit. So, for example, operational difficulties and staff turnover. And if you are on the smaller end, then the number of indicators you would consider would be fewer. You'd have fewer associated management actions. Your governance structure is simpler. You know, so your exit planning should be proportionate. If you're a larger insurer, obviously it's a it's a it's a, it's a different story. So with um on this note, I'm going to pass over to Matt McClay to talk through kind of some to dive into some of the details. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, Tony, if we could go to the next slide um, and probably the next one. Thanks. Um, so hopefully what I'm going to do today is just give a bit of a practical experience of implementing solvent exit plans. Uh, I'll I'll know that some of this actually comes from experience of, of delivering uh, or supporting firms to deliver full-blown resolution plans uh, and what we're trying to do what we'll try to do is put that in the context of the latest uh, regulatory guidance for solvent exit um, and the first thing I'll just pick up on just to build on something that Alyssa mentioned which is um, this point that um, the PRA has uh, embedded this statement around breaching the MCR in its uh, in its regulatory guidance around solvent exit and, and the solvent exit uh, execution plan, I think in practical terms, uh, any insurer that I've worked with that has been um, reaching its own risk appetite from a capital perspective will immediately start living in the world of um, recovery, resolution, solvent exit, and the, the the practical aspect is that the regulator will start to ramp up its its uh, liaison with firms and its requirements and the amount of analysis it expects to see long before a firm breaches its MCR. Um, but yeah, so we've got a slide here that's typical contents of an exit plan. And um, I mean, this will this covers both solvent exit analysis and a degree of what might be covered in solvent exit uh, execution plan. Um, I would also, as Alyssa and Radica have mentioned, like the PRA very much applies principles of proportionality, and particularly in this CP where there are a number of very small insurers captured by this re uh, proposed regulation. You would expect some level of tailoring of this to um, to the size and risk profile of the firm, but broadly speaking, I think this covers the aspects that we we see in an exit plan and and based on both exit plans and resolution plans that firms have in the market. So, just to run through some of these, um, um. You'd expect an, expect an executive summary. I think this, you know, would largely be a summary of the the, the main parts of the plan. Um, so number two, legal structure, legal entities and permissions. The extent to which this is a, a you know, a, a detailed analysis is going to be very much dependent on the complexity of the firm and the complexity of the structure. But clearly any kind of interdependencies within the legal structure and within the entity structure create 
potential barriers to uh, to exit, and therefore set. We'd expect any plan to set out very clearly um, what each entity is within the group, where they're considered material, what their role is and how they're connected to each other. So that's identifying anything to do with in, uh, you know, intercompany loans, service provision models, anything to do with um, intercompany reinsurance, for example. Uh, and you know, we, where we've done this in the past, we've tend to see like the details of the factual evidence of what that is being presented. And then later in the plan, a critical analysis of that to the extent that that impacts the ease of of exit. Um, I'll actually pause. We've got we've had our first question, and I'm going to dive in and and try to answer it uh, in the spirit of trying to make this as interactive as possible. So, the question is: In an author, there is a reverse stress test section where you work back from business model failure. Could we explore meeting this requirement through the author, or does this have to be a separate document and evidence? Um, that's a great question, uh, and and one that many firms have already explored with the regulators. Uh, and the, I mean, the possibly unhelpful answer is that where you have a named supervisor they will have very specific thoughts around this. And uh, and most of the regulatory interaction we've seen on this topic you know, has been driven at a supervisor by supervisor level. And therefore they, will, they would likely determine whether or not they expect to see a separate document or whether you could build out the analysis that you currently have in your also. I think smaller firms, uh, particularly the, the, the very small firms that are captured by this, I think you, you'd say, a much more proportionate approach could be to build out analysis in the also. I would still advise firms planning to go down this route to have a specific section, which they very clearly highlight as their solvent exit analysis. I think particularly where it is that first level mentioned in the consultation paper of solvent exit analysis rather than a solvent exit execution plan, I think, I think this would be a very pragmatic and proportionate approach. Um, and you're absolutely right in terms of reverse stress testing. You know, this business model failure and solvent exit is highly linked, but it's not potentially the only way that solvent exit analysis can be brought into the firm's thinking. You know, Alyssa mentioned that you may there may be good reasons why you want to solvently exit the market when your business model is not failing. But maybe you had to have a strategic change of direction. You have a, a different geographical footprint, um, or you want to focus on other parts of your business. You, you know, the solvent exit analysis can be useful in those situations too. So, um, so uh, good question, and uh, I think pragmatic to be thinking about how you can combine this with analysis, other analysis you've already done. Um, Okay, so to carry on on the slide, I think you know you'd expect, like any sort of regulatory based document, you'd expect a section around governance and the SMCR ownership of solvent exit. I think, um, as Alyssa said uh, or Radica said, go for more complex firms, you'd expect more individuals to be involved. You'd expect a a, a, a sort of broader governance process. This, this section you would also expect to cover if you had to act very quickly to, to enact a solvent exit plan or execution plan, you'd want to see details about how you might apply that governance in a stress scenario or in a very rapidly moving scenario. We are aware that the bigger insurers where you have a resolution plan have um, have been asked to test this governance in a kind of fire drill type setting that may be a little um a little uh over the top for uh small and medium-sized insurers but i think nonetheless you'd expect some consideration of the uh the governance aspects of this to be within your solvent exit analysis and your solvent exit plan um to a degree more relevant for the solvent Exit execution plan, but I would expect to see 
high level information about each of these aspects under point four in the solvent exit analysis. So um, an exit strategy, or at least some consideration of what Scenario, what exit strategies are available in different scenarios, particularly where you're considering ex solvent exit in a stressed scenario. Uh, this scenario will obviously may have an impact on what actions you're able to take and therefore what strategy you would have. Um, clearly outlining any assumptions and economic conditions and how they may impact uh, your solvent exit. Alyssa mentioned Critical economic functions. This, you know, was a concept that came out of the 2013 FSB paper. I think even it, it would be, it would be uh, maybe possible to say that, um, or, or it might be easy to fall into the trap of saying that, um, you know, a smaller insurers would not be critical to the broad, broader economy, and therefore you wouldn't expect them to have critical economic functions. I don't think that necessarily holds true where you're speaking about very niche insurance products. I think this is where there is um, a need to think about if you were as a firm were withdrawing from the market and going through a solvent exit, you know, what in, would there be other in, insurers that would step into the market to be able to, to provide those, those products uh, and what kind of, um, Gaps would you leave? What kind of harms may be uh, may be transferred to customers from from a sudden exit? Um, clearly, then some thought around timelines and 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 how you might wind this uh, wind the entity down. I think it's always the the PRA is always keen to see that, considering the systemic nature of of any exit from the market, the so impact on third parties. That I mean that that's that's a very should be a very broad consideration so you know not not just customers or and or shareholders but but obviously um you have suppliers that you know we're aware of a number of insurers that have strategic partnerships with suppliers where perhaps you're the the main customer or the sole the sole customer and you, and you have a kind of partnership type model what kind of impact would be on them, it's not necessarily that the PRA is looking to protect uh, or the, the like the entire economy and any any player in that, but they would want to see you that you've considered what impact that has and whether there's any mitigation you can provide. Um, operational continuity. This is probably one more for the for the solvent um, the execution plan. This is about thinking about what resources would you need and what what provisions would you need to maintain whilst you were exiting the market? So, for example, if you have a lot of contracts where you're, you can suddenly, that, that where the contract becomes null and void if you no longer, you know, a participant in the, in the market, then you'd want to do an analysis of this and, um, and think about how that can be managed throughout the, the exit process. Uh, and very much for the uh, execution plan, you'd want to see runoff forecasts, and, and and we know the PRA is very keen that firms do proportionate but but accurate modelling of of runoff um, of runoff projections um, from both capital, liquidity, and cost perspective. And then a, a number five is a key. Uh, a, a key driver of the PRA's um, consultation around uh, solvent exit, and and that is, you know, there is perhaps been an assumption, particularly in the GI market, where you have much shorter tail liabilities, that a solvent exit, you know, if you needed to exit the market, you could run off your book quite quickly, uh, and with a minimum of 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 sort of disruption. But there are things that will prevent that runoff. There are complex arrangements within groups and and contracts, contractual provisions. Um, we've got a slide uh, going into this in a little bit more detail uh, in a couple of slides time. But I think a, a key a key focus for the PRA is for firms to use this to then enhance their own business and to remove these 
barriers to exit. So, uh, you know, we've been in some recent discussions be between the PRA and the firm where the PRA has very much pushed the angle of this should be su supportive of, of driving efficiency in your business. Maybe even this analysis can be used to reduce your own cost base or, you know, identify enhancements that have a real a real franchise value over the medium and longer term. Um, Radica and Alyssa have mentioned communication plan. You, you know, with any exit, the PRA would be very uh, concerned that you have thought through who needs to be communicated to, what do you do in things like if you can't reach certain policyholders, uh, you know, and 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 you have to. Um, and you had to make some assumptions or 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 make some decisions with imperfect information. How would you deal with this from a communic communication perspective? And then uh, the final one, which again, I think you'd you'd expect high level in the exit analysis, but more detailed um, analysis within the execution plan is just the resources needed. and And we have seen for the larger insurers, this is down to, you know, who within which specific teams in the organization would be required to discharge these specific duties through a wind down or a resolution? Uh, you know, how would you retain, retain them uh, if all of this was winding down? You know, what, what about central functions? What about IT? What about risk? What about um, legal support, et cetera? You know, really ring fencing what resources you might need to enact a solvent exit. Um, if we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, okay, so modeling of exit scenarios. Um, the execution plan, um, well, the, I think the solvent exit analysis should have a high level consideration of scenarios and, and you'd expect to think about what actions you can take as part of your exit analysis and what Im impact they would have. The degree to which you need to model those and to specify them in a in a in a level of detail will depend on again your supervisor's um, uh, level of comfort with your your exit planning analysis and also the you know their assessment of how likely this might be needed to be implemented, but also I think you can expect. Uh, I strongly expect that you know a cat, a cat two or a cat three firm is like to have more uh, like is required to go further in its analysis uh, of scenarios and modeling than than a cat four or five firm. Um, I mean, typical actions you might take could be things like changes in asset mix as you run off the business, change you know expense space changes and changing. As you as you run off your business, there might be uh, economies of scale where you can, uh, depending on how long your runoff is, or you might be able to renegotiate contracts, or you might have the problem that you can't renegotiate these contracts and therefore you have to be baking into your wind down analysis that you're going to have to be paying a much higher proportionate cost for things like policy servicing than than uh, if you, you know you than when you're you were in a BAU scenario. Um, you, you you know you you can set out in quite a level of detail the impacts you take and uh, and consider these actions uh, and their impact on all of the key economic indicators like capital, liquidity, profit, etc. And just to give some practical insights about where we've done this before, you know. Start with the base case assumption in your plan, and then you can like layer in the different exit actions. You know, a high level way of doing this is to perhaps you know do this action by action and look consider it over a medium scale, a medium time frame, um, and look at each of one of those actions in turn. Um, as I mentioned before, the scenario does really matter. You know, and so does the order in which you take these actions. So that's an area to consider. Um, for larger firms, the PRA for, uh, definitely expects firms to use their regulatory models, so you know internal models or standard formula models. 
but uh, uh, my tip would be don't get too tied up in spurious levels of accuracy. You want to have reasonable assumptions that you can defend, but you wouldn't necessarily, you know, any scenario that you run is going to be different uh, different to what happens in real life. And therefore, you know, uh, that extra work to get to that spurious level of accuracy is probably not... Um, not the most effective use of time. I think the key is to consider the actions, the implications, and, and what that means for your business. Um, if you are going to do modeling, um, you know, and, and you, you, you're, you're trying to deliver a solvent exit analysis in response to, say, regulatory uh, deadline, um, then plan model runs at the start because this, in practice, is something we, we worked with a firm where, you know, we had to do three separate model runs because board and uh, and the senior executives changed assumptions several times during this process. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, we had to go back to the modeling. So planning that out in advance is very helpful. Um, and then this one's maybe one that was not always obvious to firms, but you can test the feasibility and cost of some of your actions. You know, if you have friendly reinsurers or, um, or, or, or suppliers, you know, you can have the conversation. They're usually very open to saying, you know, if we were in this scenario and we needed to add in extra reinsurance or we needed to, you know, uh, look at renegotiating contracts, et cetera, what, what do we think might happen in that scenario? Give, can you give us a, a, you know, a realistic estimate that we can use for our, our planning? Um, uh, and, and we've done that with very... Uh, um, Good effect in 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 these exercises in the past, and it's something the PRA very much likes to see. If we move to the next slide, so I won't spend too long on this, but just a, a word on resources and costs. Uh, this is definitely something that sort the solvent exit analysis you know needs to have at least a high level understanding of. Um, you know, we talked a lot about. I've talked a lot already about impact on plan and impact on capital and liquidity and funding levels. But um, uh, yeah, there are a lot of non-financial resource elements to think about. And from a cost perspective, this is something where we know the PRA is interested to see firms putting accurate estimates around costs. So this particularly, we've seen them call out fees for specialist advisors, you know, not even though this is a solvent exit, we have seen the PRA advise firms to get input from insolvency practitioners for, you know, how would they think about scenarios? When would the point at which you would trigger a insolvent wind down versus a solvent wind down? Uh, so, you know, they would expect to potentially see some fees for consulting insolvency specialists. Um, then you've got a lot of different business, additional business costs that you'd have to layer in, such as, you know, retention payments for key staff, uh, contract termination penalties, pension funds is always a big stumbling block, particularly where they have, where there are uh, non-fully funded defined benefit pensions that, that, you know, would have rights and actions they could take for recourse in, a, in an exit uh, scenario. So if we move on to the next slide, I'll just briefly touch on this point around barriers to exit because I do think this is a very, uh, very important aspect of the CP. And as I mentioned before, this is something that the PRA would expect firms to be identifying and then feeding back into the, their own BAU um, uh, running of their business. So to just touch on these, so critical functions, clearly if you are, if you provide a very niche service, niche product, or you have very vulnerable customers, or you have a very high market share, you know this is going to imply a more uh, a, a more dysfunctional exit, even if, and therefore you're going to have to provide additional analysis, and it's a higher hurdle to be able to demonstrate to the PRA that you can exit um, uh, with the minimum of disruption. Um, and think through things like, are there other insurers in the market who we would naturally, you know, look to say, like to to sell assets or, or books of business to, you know, are there, are there um, 
other providers that would step into the market and uh, and take up the business if we if we were to withdraw from it. Um, we've mentioned many legal aspects already, but you know, uh, certainly, certainly in a, a solvent exit execution plan, but to a degree within the high, uh, the exit analysis, you'd expect to un to identify key contracts, key suppliers, and uh, the PRA would be very um, interested to understand where there are term, you know, specific exit terms within these contracts that may be triggered in a in an in an exit scenario. Clearly, if you're considering a stressed exit, even a solvent one, you're going to have to think through whether those your asset valuations would impact your ability to take solvent exit actions. You know. What does that do from like to the attractiveness of the of the business if you were looking at a, a strategy of selling? Or how would that what would that mean from a capital perspective if you were going to run this off? Um, if you are going to uh, if you are going to propose a strategy of a solvent exit sale of business, then think through the service provision model, for example, you know, would you be able to provide transitional service agreements to another provider? How would that work? Would that work out of current service entities? Would you need to set up new service entities to be able to do that? Think through all the policy and customer, uh, policyholder and customer impacts. So mentioned, can you reach all of your policyholders or your, uh, you know, what about non-insurance customers and ancillary businesses if you provide sort of, you know, specialist ancillary services alongside general insurance, then, you know, the, you know, how are they going to be impacted by an exit of your insurance entity, even if that's not the primary, um, the primary regulated business within the group? Um, and, and as I've already mentioned, think through any barriers to, to respect to sales. Uh, so we've got a, a question. So, I'll try and cover now. So who would typically lead the overall production of a recovery and resolution plan, uh, finance uh, with risk management input or risk management with finance, other functions providing input? Um, I, I don't think there is an actual, like, you know, I don't think there's a specific, um, one specific answer to this. Um, we have seen both, uh, both ways around. I think, the key, the key thing here is you'd expect a, a wide range of functions to be involved. I think if either finance or risk were doing this in isolation, then that would be considered problematic from the PRA. Um, but similarly, if only finance and risk were involved, I think they would expect to see consideration of compliance, legal, operations, etc. So uh, I think um, you could run it Either way, I mean, where we've done this with some other firms, we, we've had, you know, a program structure, particularly where you're doing this for the first time, um, and uh, and particularly where you're a larger insurer and you've got like, and the analysis is likely to be more complex, and and that had a proper project management office with uh, finance and and risk both represented. Um, so yeah, I think uh, we could you could run it either way. Okay, if we could move to the next slide, please. And I'll hand over to Alyssa. Brilliant, thank you. So this is kind of a very practical part of the solvent um, exit um, plan for the sol and the solvent exit execution plan as, um, as well for, for the matter. So it's really not going to spend too much time on this, but this basically touches on you should document who you should be who's going to do the communication, how are they going to do it, and with whom. So it kind of thinks through a variety of kind of internal stakeholders, external st stakeholders as well, you know, not just policyholders, you know, do you uh, do, do you have any data gaps? Can you reach your policyholders or not? Or is it one of the risks to a successful implementation of a solvent exit? Um, you know, who are your, you know, and, and depending on what, what kind of insurer you are, it could be kind of as simple as kind of, a, you know, he, 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 here's our executive team, this is who they're going to pick up the phone to, this is our kind of 
this is how we'll reach um, policyholders if you're kind of part of a uh, if you're a larger insurer that could be um, you know a lot more significant so you 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 want to think through how you're going to um, uh, manage the messaging but also kind of uh, map out key risks or key reactions to your communication and and how you're going to mitigate it so for example if you're going into a stress um exit you know you're communicating it to your staff and then you have resignations from uh, some of the key 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 function holders do, do you have any kind of mitigations in place in terms of how you are how you're going to handle it um if we could just go over to um uh, the next slide so kind of very key to the process is the governance decision making and uh, an assurance part of um solvent exit planning so uh, you know there's already been a question in terms of you know who who leads in it you know and also it's um, you need to assign a senior manager responsibility over this it's actually quite a difficult one to do because it covers a number of stages which on its face of it could be fairly different in terms of what they require from the individual. So it's, you know, going from business as usual, solvent exit planning, including producing the, the analysis through to es es escalation, decision making, deciding on where, when you are within your triggers and then solvent exit execution um, itself. So it's, it's, so it's covers, you know, one person across the, the, the three pillars. Um, obviously, you need to have very, very clear governance in terms of who's uh, who's approving it. How do you update it? How do you update it? You know, as Radhika has mentioned at the beginning, you need to update it every three years. But how you're going to identify if there has been a material change um, in the meantime? Um, decision making during exit. So um, again, how you know, clarity as to who's going to decide what and when kind of what the structure would is like do you need to go to group to get approval you know obviously the, the both regulators would expect to be involved but also you know have you considered regulators um regulators elsewhere and how uh, they're going to be notified have you built this into your process you know various levels of sign off um again do you have adequate um you, bra is current bra and fca are currently um looking at do, do, do firms have the sufficient resource both at the planning but um and but also execution stage you know do you have the right data um have you had realistic uh projections and to kind of help with that the bra expects a degree of um assurance over the planning process so this could be either internal for example your internal audit function or you can um you can go externally. So um just conscious to have massive amounts of time. So you know, please do if you have any kind of urgent major questions, you know, please do put put them in the chat. Otherwise, I'm just going to very quickly, if we can go two slides over, I'm going to pick up in terms of how you would go about actually getting a project up and running. So, you know, so the first step is kind of setting up your project governance and I think the first piece is actually establishing whether or not you have um, critical economic functions because that's going to a large extent drive the rest of your analysis so if you have economic critical functions you, you know you'll need to you know to go into a layer of analysis which otherwise you wouldn't do I think in terms of where firms are at from our discussions I think you know there'll be a variety of approaches depending on where you are so kind of at the I think most firms will want to, at the first instance, get the solvent exit analysis over the line so that it broadly, you know, so that it meets regulatory expectations. So it could be something like, um, you know, for example, we've got a, a template, uh, then either kind of uh, and sort of kind of broadly follow what kind of populated with their own information with a kind of a sense check. Have I covered everything that a regulator wants to cover? Kind of on the other side of the spectrum, there are firms who uh, with whom we um, we're working with who are under you know fair amount of uh, regulatory scrutiny either because of you know things which are which are kind of happening internal to them or maybe the bra things they're more likely to have 
um, you know, even, even though kind of at the moment they're not under stress, if they were under stress, the play, um, a, you know, the, the specific niche product would be disruptive to um, other players um, in the market. And so they're kind of proactively getting firms to think through a much broader degree of um, de degree of planning. So, um, you know, very much for you to judge. I think most firms would be kind of on the, you know, let's just, you know, prepare a plan which is acceptable to the regulator. You know, let's uh, let's be pragmatic about this. Leverage existing information as much as possible and repurpose um other documents. And again, just you know, there there are there are a significant number of um functions which need to be involved. So hence why the project governance perspective and setting this up so that you are able to get all of the input, but so that it but it, so the run smoothly is, is quite key to a successful um, delivery of a first solvent exit analysis. And obviously there is a piece in terms of how do you turn this from an initial project and transforming this into business as usual. And I'll just pass over to Matt just to wrap up and maybe share some of uh, lessons learned. Yeah, if we could go to the next slide, please. Yeah, just I just wanted to to wrap, bring this all together and 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 wrap it up. Um, uh, we're just giving a few messages. Like, I think we've probably given most of these messages through the presentation, but um, just just these are the things that I would lead, uh, would 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 have in my mind based on what we've done with other firms. So, first of all. There is a wide range of stakeholders required, so proper broadband management is key. You know, we on the previous slide it mentioned, you know, legal, ops, company secretariat, compliance, risk, finance. All of these potentially more would would be involved for a, for a larger insurer. Um, actually, getting in senior management and senior stakeholders to think about a a exit type scenario or a resolution type scenario, if that is not something that is on the horizon, is actually quite difficult. It, you know, you need to get a lot of people bought in. So engage early to think about remote types of scenarios because it's not everybody's natural thinking. You know, people are focused on delivering, you know, good commercial outcomes, not thinking about winding down their business. Lockdown and document key assumptions. Um, early um, and, and and before completing detail analysis, I mentioned you, you want to minimize any risk of having to do rework. Um, and so the extent to which assumptions change that can be in this type of analysis can can create quite a lot of rework. Um, say so understand where accuracy is important and where it's not. Um, you know, Life insurers have had a COVID nine a, a pandemic style scenario in the scenarios that they run for, you know, for years, and then COVID nineteen came along, and it was completely different to how everyone had been, you know, modelling and or, uh, and and thinking about it. So any scenario will be different. So you know, getting spurious levels of accuracy around scenario impacts is probably not where you want to focus your time, but being clear on actions and what type of what impact those actions would have probably is um you know where you can add an uh, where you can add value many firms will see this as a regulatory you know a regulatory driven exercise that you know some firms will see as tick the box but there is actual there are some actual benefits that can be be achieved from this type of analysis you know for example i mentioned you might be some some uh, reviewing contracts could lead to areas where you can reduce costs or renegotiate on more commercial terms. Um, uh, and there are many other examples as well. And then it, exactly to the question that someone asked earlier, which was uh, around the author, like leverage existing analysis where possible. Um, you know, operational resilience and important business services has a very close link to, you know, some of what you're 
what you'd have to think about as you were uh, winding down a, a, an entity. Similarly, the author with scenarios, reverse stress tests, all of this will provide a good foundation for solvent exit analysis. So, you know, reuse it where you can um, and build on what you already have. Um, I know we're now at time, we're probably slightly over. So um, I think um, from my perspective, uh, well, I'm just gonna check. We had one final question, which was on which SMCR function would be accountable for this. Um, I think this is two sides to the same, sort of the same question that was asked earlier about how, who would you expect to run with this? I mean, I don't think, I think there are different options, but I think that, you know, this, to allow a proper challenge of this from the risk function, you know, you may expect this to be a first line individual owning this analysis. So finance, actuarial, or um, operations, uh, even legal in some in some cases. But, um, you know, I think to my my perspective on this is that less important exactly who who leads it this is an exercise that requires input from a lot of different uh, a lot of different functions and therefore you know you, whoever is accountable is going to be relying on input from from a lot of specialists and therefore we you, you know you're going to want to have a structure a governance structure and a setup that allows them to discharge their duty off the back of the analysis done by others so um i think that's the key point for me um, so with that, I think we've concluded our presentation. I know some people have stayed on post the post the hour, so that uh, thank you for that. Thank you to everyone else that joined. Um, uh, yeah, if uh, if there's nothing further, then uh, I think uh, we'll we'll wrap it up there.